friend see you i am not showing my video my video is not on what you want to see me <laughs> yeah, yes good to see you yeah hello yeah. yeah. hi hello i'm sunil hi reshma the other right from the day first uh, sunil ji took a very uh, descriptive subjects and uh, very well it was a uh, uh, very good learning process although i was not there for the whole time but i watched it on youtube afterwards in the evenings and uh, i really uh, i am wondering that how much knowledge we have missed in uh, last years of my life but anyway better late than never and today i am uh, eagerly waiting for your uh, uh, lecture uh, sunil ji reshma pitare uh, dr reshma pitare uh, she is working in bombay natural history science bnhs mumbai and we made one of our iucn congress at hawaii and since then uh, we are always chatting and me meeting sometimes if possible so uh, when we uh, have thought about uh, starting this courses the first name other than you uh, it came in my mind is reshma uh, so reshma today is all yours and we are really waiting for your uh, deliverables yes can you time shall i share, share the screen or you have something else to present or to start with no no it's your time you can share this okay uh is it visible the presentation yes yes you are yes. visible yes but uh reshma ha huh? yeah before that i think uh, you should introduce little more about you uh, and even uh, yes. sunil ji you also uh, uh, you also can explain the background of this courses to reshma means i told her but uh, um, more than me i think you are the right person who can uh, tell her about it yeah sure sure so please i think you start uh, means uh, about your introduction okay uh, so hi good uh, good evening everyone uh, myself reshma i work with uh, bnhs bombay natural history society which is a mumbai based uh, ngo uh, but we work pan india we have different field stations and uh, research centers all across the country uh we have a history of about uh, or rather more than 138 years we have established in 1883 uh in mumbai and since then we are working on uh primarily on research based conservation apart from education and awareness activities uh we have excellent museum uh, based in mumbai where we have more than 60 80 years old uh, specimens uh bird specimens and many more insect specimens and many more tags are there uh apart from that if you would like to know more about bnhs please go and visit uh, bnhs.org we have multiple activities regarding education and awareness as well so people can participate and know more about the various habitats the bnhs activities the birds uh, many other species the Uh, lesser known taxa we are working with and so on so forth so apart from that about myself i started my career more or less around 2010 uh first with Nation, uh, national institute of oceanography uh, nio mumbai uh, where i was mainly involved with the benthos that is the sediment study where we look for the microorganisms which lives within the sediment uh from different places i was mainly working for gujarat and maharashtra uh later i joined bnhs for one of the project in maharashtra in kokan area uh this was about the 
uh, identifying the biodiversity of particular region of course the coastal areas uh, apart from that I, i have also developed in between i have also developed interest for the taxonomy that is identifying the worms the special worms the polyclad taxa where my expertise is so i have along with the bnhs projects and the other activities which i used to be a part with i have also uh, started my taxonomic work because that was the core interest of my or rather personal interest of me so uh, later the project goes on uh, we worked on the kokan area then later around 2015 we have got the big project from maharashtra the entire maharashtra where we uh, uh, th- that was a rapid assessment so we look at the all the sites all possible sites the intertidal areas coastal areas of course all the creeks the sandy shores rocky shores uh, we could uh, we could work for and then we identified the diversity and all that later we have a small project of creating a database based on the data we have cre- created from this project which was uh, for entire maharashtra apart from that i have visited many other places uh, for small projects or you know my t- taxonomic interest like andaman lakshadweep uh, some part of gujarat and so on so presently uh, i'm working in mumbai we have a one uh, long term project in mumbai for the bridge which is coming uh, the trans harbor link which is coming in mumbai uh, 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 joining the mumbai and navi mumbai area so we are working in that area because that the entire creek where the bridge is coming the mouth area of the creek where this bridge is coming uh, the the entire creek is full of all holds the great diversity of uh, migratory birds so uh, again i i am looking at the uh, the sediment analysis the microbenthic features looking at the microbenthic features because these birds mostly feeding on them they and then we have a colleague the other team which looks after the ringing the telemetric analysis and the bird part or the avifaunal studies so that's the long term project we're looking at the changes uh, happening all across the uh, month all across the years uh, this is not just about the bridge which is coming at the at that area but also it is it is rightly placed in the middle of the city the mumbai and the navi mumbai which is one of the hugely populated cities so it receives the uh, multiple inf- uh, interference interventions from uh, the adjoining population industries and so on so it's a very interesting area to work with because there are multiple factors which are acting on that habitat and uh, you know understanding the ecology and what is happening exactly in that area is a very interesting stuff to deal with so that's it about b and bnhs so uh, about marine bio- biodiversity or the presentation i'll be delivering today as the name suggests i have mentioned here purposely what's in our backyard so i'm i'm mentioning again and again even in my introduction that i was mostly involved with the coastal habitats or the intertidal habitats so what is these habitats exactly and why the name uh, in your backyard uh the people who are uh, living in the coastal areas or the coastal cities or villages i think they can relate this very much uh, with this because these coastal habitats are right in the uh, uh, right in the uh, in our backyard or just adjacent to us lying adjacent to us they connect us they connect cities they connect villages with the sea that's the that's the middle portion where these coastal habitats are lying we deal with these habitats or we, we are related with these habitats in our, for our day to day activities uh that's why i have mentioned this in the title that what is there what is the diversity biodiversity uh, these coastal habitats so which are right there in our backyard so start with uh, i will just explain uh, to our people the area where this exact area where i'm which i'm talking about or which i'm mentioning about so this is the terrestrial area the plants which you can see a village or a city and then the shoreline starts somewhere the shoreline starts and this is the intertidal area as the name suggest intertidal that is something between the tidal as you all must be aware that at the coast at the shore uh, the water comes during the high tide and resides during the low tide 
so that's why this is the intertidal area the area right in between the or right in the middle of the tidal uh, fluctu uh, tidal zonation so this is the area uh, we, uh, uh, i'll be referring to in my today's presentation from the intertidal area there is a supra tidal uh, or supra littoral or the subtidal zone which is mainly of a water column and the benthic area or the sediment uh, lying below so this is the area which is easily accessible to all of us we can go any time we go to shore if uh, you have experienced or if if you have gone sometimes to the beach at least for having a bhelpuri or pani puri so you must be aware of this area so why this area is important so we have a long stretch of a shoreline or the or the intertidal area uh, which exposed during the low tide that's that's the peculiar character of that area which exposes during the low tide and water comes up during the high tide uh, uh, the the geomorphology or the shape or the structures or the habitat it holds or the physical structure of this area varies uh, uh, from few meters to few kilometers uh, because that all depends on the geomorphological feature of that particular area so starting from gujarat to south and from again uh, uh, up to the west bengal we have a shoreline but which differs with or it has a peculiar characters everywhere uh, based on the geomorphological or the physical structures of that particular area so the most important ecosystem service or the most important uh, service it shares with us is maintaining the biological balance of the overall marine ecosystem why it balances the balance uh, balances the system i will talk about this later in the later in my presentation so how coastal population is depend on this area as i have mentioned this area is very close just adjacent to the uh, to the villages or the populated areas so uh, the many coastal population is depend on this area just, not just because of the uh, uh, not just because the source it gives the source of a food or just for the fishing but in recent days there is a lot of about tourism and the recreational activities the scuba diving snorkeling and so on so it is also become a source of income and many other factors it shares with us in terms of many scenes in terms of uh, many other factors i would say which i will elaborate about that in later in my presentation so that is why the coastal population is more or less dependent on this areas the one more uh, uh, important point which i forgot to mention here uh why studying this coastal habitats or understanding this coastal habitat is important that as you have seen the position of these uh, uh, habitats they are right in between the sea and the terrestrial part so they connect the terrestrial so they connect the terrestrial part to the uh, shore uh, to the uh, uh, sea but importantly it receive influence from the terrestrial side or as well as from the sea side so this area is very much important to learn because of this aspect because it receives the influence from the terrestrial side as well as from the sea side so we have uh habitats like mangroves mudflats rocky sandy shores estuaries salt pans coral reefs and sea grass beds in lying in the coastal areas so let's let's know more about these habitats first later i will elaborate on the diversity or the biotic uh, component lying within these uh, habitats so we will understand the habitats one by one so rocky shores rocky shores as the name suggest Uh, 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 or you can see in the pictures are basic uh, are the rocky structures or the flat structures but according to the site according to the physical structure of that area the the basic morphology of these or the basic structures of the shore differs as you can see here in the picture there are some flat areas of the shore some of the areas which just holds the big boulders some of the areas which has a watery beaches or the rock pools some areas like are extremely steep and directly get into the sea so like this the vertical cliff we can call it as so like this the geomorphological features differs side to side meters to kilometers to kilometer but the basic structure remains same that is of a form of a rock the different rocks and then these are the engraved rock pools which also holds the great diversity 
I must tell you that Rocky Shore is as much as rich as the one coral reef because they also sh shares many microhabitats. Because as you can see, the 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 rocks, the boulders, the pebbles, cobbles lying over these areas also share, gives or also create the macro habitat, the small small spaces uh, uh, where these tiny creatures uh, survive, where these tiny creatures flourishes. And it also shares the space for to flourish the algal uh, diversity. So that's why uh, these area, the studying the rocky shores are also extremely interesting for any marine biologist because it is as diverse as coral reefs. You can see as as colorful structures or as colorful biological components you see at the coral reef. Very similar components you can see at the rocky shore and very interesting ecology they shares. So that's the important uh, uh, about the rocky shores. And one more thing to mention here is, as I have mentioned, this is the area between the high tide and the low tide. So water resides almost for five to six hours, and then the water comes up uh, during the high tide. So these uh, the animals which lives uh, at the rocky shores or which inhabits the rocky shore areas, almost uh, you know exposed to intense sunlight desiccation probably because there is no water so they they don't get any water so there may be a dehydration so all these environmental conditions so there are very peculiar animals there are very peculiar uh, you know biotic components which uh, you know prefer to stay uh, or the holds the uh, rocky shore habitats so that is again a very interesting factors to learn about rocky shores uh, the, I have mentioned these engraved lock, rock pools or the watery ditches. So these ditches are sometimes not just ditches, but but are deep pools. These are the, po the pools are like few meters down. Sometimes you cannot see the base, and some pools are very shallow, and you can literally have snorkel and uh, see the uh, you know diversity lying over there. And they also holds uh, a peculiar zonation, like some of the creatures. Uh, you know, prefer to be uh, in the sunlight as well as within the water. So, so they will hold uh, the upper part or the upper strata stratum of the rock pool or the upper zone of the rock pool. And then some of the uh, some of the animals are really uh, sh uh, shade loving. So they will prefer to be down somewhere inside. Uh, you know, uh, preferring the shady places of the rock pool. So this is how there is a particular zonation uh, of these animals. So that is again a uh, very interesting factors to learn about uh, the rocky shores and the rock pools. So these pictures are from the rocky shores of Ratnagiri where I uh, was mostly working for. Ratnagiri is one of the places from Maharashtra. Uh, so you can see the diversity. This is one kind of a zoo anthers which are relative to, relatives to coral. This is a sea anemone. There are sponges, there are algae, there are hydroids. And many other, you can see the uh, fishes, you know, uh, swimming here. So, and these are the cobalt pebble structures. If you underturn these rocks, you will see a great diversity lying over there. So that's that's the beautiful uh, things which I was mentioning about. You can see the colors here. You will obviously you can relate these pictures with the coral reef. If I if I'm not saying telling you that these pictures are from are from rock pool. You might feel that these pictures are from the coral reef, but these are not. These pictures are from the rocky areas, the rocky shores of the uh, rock pools, which are present in here in India, uh, in Maharashtra. So what is the importance of these rocky shores for overall marine ecosystem? So first of all, it gives the stability, as, as the theme suggests, uh, or the physical structure. Uh, it is made up of. They are made up of rocks, so obviously they gives the stability, the solid structure to the shoreline. And there are many animals, there are many organisms which prefers to be, uh, you know, they need some hard substrate to stick uh, or to, uh, you know, uh, flourish uh, ahead. So like there are uh, sea anemones or there are uh, zoo anthids or there are many colon colony uh, bearing sedentary uh, species which need some substrate to stick over. So the, the 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 hard substratum the rocky shore provides is a very very uh, useful or the very ideal uh, environment for these kind of uh, organisms. Apart from that, it also takes part in the carbon sequestration the other way. 
the algal component and the many other uh, uh, components which are there which helps in carbon sequestration the biological components of course uh, and then the last point which i have mentioned here on the slide that it is a natural laboratory uh, many researchers uh, you know refer rocky shores as a natural laboratory i will repeat why as i have mentioned uh, earlier in one of one of the slide that uh, these shores almost get exposed for 5 to 6 hours so these animals this tiny creatures uh, here are exposed for almost for 5 to 6 hours they receive the intense sunlight there are probably no water so the chances of dehydration and many other physico chemical changes which happens in their environment because the water resides so there is a very peculiar structure very peculiar zonation which gets created so particular organism as i have mentioned for the rock pools that some of the organism like you can see here in the picture the brown color algae which constantly needs the sunlight for the photosynthesis they will always prefer the upper stratum upper zone of the rock pool and the shade loving organisms like this uh, right here in the pictures the hydroids the zoo, uh, uh, the anemones uh species or the fishes maybe they will always uh, uh, need some kind of a shelter some kind of a, you know predator refuge or some place to hide uh, from the other predators will prefer the shady places so accordingly where the, it it the zonation gets created and that's why this is a natural laboratory to to uh, you know learn all these things because since there is a very ideal and the natural zonation if anything wrong or if anything any factor any physical any physical chemical component or any other environmental parameter or any other introduced parameter is influencing uh, these animal influencing the environment over there this zonation these animals starts reflecting these in terms of uh, their population in terms of their density in terms of the places they are holding the places they supposed to be and the places uh they are now supposed to be because of certain influential uh, influential conditions so these are the things which you can capture into your data and find out the inferences that why these changes are happening because this particular group of animals should be here in the high tide zone or in into the water or in somewhere there in the low tide zone so why these things are happening or why the density is reducing or why these animals are you see uh, they are approaching the other places or they are shifting to somewhere else so all these things can be captured in terms of you know there are many uh, research methodologies or the work which is happening the detailed work which people do and find out that why these things are changing and we can understand the overall uh, changes happening in the environment that is why many researchers turned uh rocky shores as a uh, natural laboratory or it can be served as a useful tool to understand the how the climate is changing or how the climate change is uh, deriving the influences into the physico chemical factors so let's start with the sandy shores we know sandy shores just because uh, we get a bhelpuri over there no that's that's not the sandy shore uh, we should know about there there are there is something much more about the sandy shores probably you heard uh, that many uh, turtles come to the sandy shore for the nesting and many other factors why sandy shores are important so first of all before uh, going to that point i will i will let you know there are three types of uh, shores we can divide one is reflective dissipative and the intermediate Ref and all these segregation is based on the slope of the sand uh, you can see some of the shores are extremely flat about 50 about kilometer long you can go to to go to the water you really need to walk like kilometers and some of the shores which are straight steep slope directly getting into the water so this is how the sandy shores are segregated based on the slope uh, they have and you can see here in the picture there is literally nothing you can see there are no animals you feel but no that's not the case there are tiny microorganism in lakhs in thousands lying within these tiny spaces of the sand which is known as interstitial spaces so there are probably lakhs of worms the shells 
and the other microorganism holding these sand components and living within these sandy shores so there are brachiurans that means crabs there are shells uh, and there are many other kind of worms which prefer this habitat uh, and inhabit this habitat so what is the importance we all know turtle comes to the sandy shores for breeding every year the turtle female lays the uh, or the prefers the same uh, uh, sandy shore where she uh, uh, got birth so so she comes to the same shore so that's the importance of sandy shore there are many birds who also prefer uh, or the migratory birds who prefer many uh, sandy shores as a stopover sites or the uh, or many uh, for many this is a nursery uh, areas apart from that for us they, there are also recreational opportunities the sandy shores are source of a sand and importantly they are natural biocatalytical filters then what is biocatalytical filters as you can see the the sand particles are really tiny microscopic uh, particles and they holds the tiny spaces between these particles so whatever comes through the water the organic material or any other material can get sieved through these sand water gets back into the sea and those that material remains within the sand at the coast so this is how it the it, this is this works as a bio catalytical filter naturally uh sand dunes are basically the dry areas probably you can see the domes dome shape uh sand dunes just back uh, at the sandy shores close to the village probably so how these sand dunes are from so there are needs a particular wind energy or uh, uh, the wind direction through which the uh, the sand gets deposited in a particular shape at the particular direction towards the terrestrial uh, side and that is a sand dune so there are multiple uh, uh, shape of these dunes so sometimes it is dome shaped sometimes flat eccentric and so on and all this is depends on the wind shape wind energy or the wind direction uh, where these uh, sand dunes are getting formed so there are many vegetations you can see here in the sand probably you feel that this is again it just a dry areas and what is this small or tiny plants must be doing over there so no that's not the case again these uh, the the vegetation uh, which sustain within this dry sand because as you can imagine uh, the sand dunes are at the back side of the sandy areas where water the sea water never reaches or reaches very rarely or there can be a, a splashes of uh, water so these areas are really very dry uh, then uh, exposed to intense sunlight again so how, so uh, the vegetation which can hold or which can sustain in this area is real, really particular which are adapted to live within this kind of a environment so uh, this vegetation uh, has a deep root to uh, get the uh, water content as well as the grasses has the nitrify the soil uh, and allows less hardy plants to colonize the dune so there are multiple functions these uh, vegetation performs over there so apart from the all these functions again the sand dune is protects the shore uh, the physical barrier and protect the land from the heavy heavy wave of so during the monsoon or the unfortunate events like tsunamis and so on the sand dunes you know somewhere uh, uh, you know sustain the terrestrial part or, or or probably can low down the effect of these harsh or destructive waves uh, casuarina plantation is one of the critical factors or one of the uh, uh, you know very critical plantation which is happening in the sand dunes sometimes uh, i have seen that these sand dunes are flat flattened and the plantation uh, has been done the casuarina plantation which is completely destroying the natural shape the natural formation of sand dunes and the natural vegetation as well because these casuarina long casuarina trunks uh, outcompete the natural vegetation over there you can see the vegetation the small vegetation uh, lying within the sand and the casuarina plants are really tall uh, plants uh, which are getting planted over the 
over the sand dunes or the dry areas of the dune so they easily compete with this natural vegetation and obviously uh, which disrupts the uh, you know natural functions of the dune so mangroves again very interesting uh, vegetation forms because they live again between the sea and the soil interface uh so they have a special adaptations so they can survive within the swampy and probably dirty or the muddy areas uh so we'll see what are those uh, adaptations are but before that i must highlight here that mangroves are among the most carbon rich forest uh, in the tropics and uh, uh, they create almost two to four times greater uh, uh, you know uh, carbon sequestration than any mature tropical forest so that's the importance of mangrove almost two to four times greater carbon sequestration rate they have than the tropical dense forest so that that's the mangroves you can see in here in the picture you can see here in the picture the the roots of these plants you never see this kind of this kind of arrangements of plants or this kind of a morphology of plants in the terrestrial side you can see some roots the pointed roots which are coming from the uh, soil or the mud directly upward vertical roots the triangular roots or the pointed roots which are coming so we'll see what are those adaptations so mangroves leaves in a extreme saline conditions because uh, in some of the upstream creek areas or some of the areas where again uh, the water the saline water uh, is not possible to reach daily because of the physical structures over there or because of the currents and all other factors these areas are uh, very less oxygenated then high organic content and loose muddy substratum as you have seen in the rock, rocky shore the rock itself is a sol provides the solid substratum to the organism to organism flourish there that's why i have mentioned there the organism which needs a strong hard substratum flourish there so the same here the loose muddy substratum uh, which cannot provide a firm substratum to any of the organism so what what kind of uh, organisms or what kind of vegetation can survive here so they need a special kind of adaptation to be here so these mangroves have special breathing arcing roots which can hold them within the swampy loose muddy areas as well as uh, they can breathe uh, so that they can uh, and the salt accepting leaves as i have mentioned these are extremely saline conditions they live within the extreme saline conditions so they need to exempt this salt out of their body the uh, the plant body so how do they do that they use the leaves they, the leaves of the plant have the special adaptations which exempt this uh, excessive salt and this is how mangrove can sustain uh, within these areas importance of mangrove i think we all have heard uh, in multiple uh, uh, you know programs or the news or the you know articles news articles probably uh that mangroves can help us or uh, in survive during the tsunami or the high surges yes as these adaptations helps mangrove to sustain within these swampy areas they hold the substratum so tightly that during these high surges or the tsunami waves which really really have a great forces and really can disturb entire cities or villages can uh, you know survive within this pressure the uh, the destructive waves the forces of this destructive waves can be slow down uh, the pressure is absorbed by these mangroves and uh, uh, the villages or the cities can be saved so that's the most important uh, you know ecosystem services mangroves shares with us uh, very important you must have uh, read somewhere in the newspaper that the tsunami cases or wherever there are mangroves uh, the destructions by the tsunamis are very very less as compared to the areas where they they were directly exposed to the uh, you know show directly exposed to the shore or directly exposed to the these heavy uh, wave actions uh, so we must understand the importance of mangrove in that sense 
apart from that uh, the area the environment within the mangrove is preferred by many shell organisms the many uh, you know many fishes the shell fishes so they come back literally come back from the sea they migrate from the sea to the mangrove areas uh, uh, during their nursery or during their breeding period and uh, they in within the mangroves and uh, comes up so apart from that they are source of economically important shellfishes and many other products uh, they stabilize the sediment which i have already mentioned and the sources of fuel wood cattle feed and many medicinal benefits these mangrove species shares with us so much flat these are the mangroves these are the mangroves and these are the open swampy probably dirty muddy areas so what is the use of these areas are they really important do they hold any biodiversity what you feed do they hold any kind of animals over here yes they do uh, if any one of you uh, uh, prefers the oysters in their meals or uh, other other shellfishes they prefer in their meal they come from these areas the crabs you you like to eat crab uh, in, the, in in your meal they come from these areas so there are many oysters species there are many crab species which prefers this kind of a mud flats uh, they flourish uh, within this kind of a mud flats so these empty so called wastelands or not really wastelands these are really important places these are really important habitats uh, apart from these tiny creatures sorry apart from these tiny creatures they are also uh, holds the diversity of many worms and many other small creatures uh, which are again preferred by the migratory birds or the, these birds feed upon these or uh, these areas are also used by these birds as a resting sites or the roosting sites we can call it as and that's why these muddy areas are extremely important this picture is from mumbai uh, the city along the west coast of india in maharashtra you can see uh, the flamingos feeding on these bird fly the open areas the muddy areas which gets exposed during the low tide and thousands of flamingos lakhs of fl flamingos comes every year to mumbai uh, they use this site as their uh, you know roosting place or a feeding place during their migratory uh, route so that's the picture from mumbai sea grasses very similar to mangroves uh, but very tiny uh, uh, you know compared to the size of the mangrove these are the plants uh, which prefers close to the uh, which flourish close to the sediment but uh, i can tell you that almost 1 uh, square kilometer of sea grass can generate 10 liters of oxygen uh, during their photosynthetic activity so you can imagine the importance of sea grass or how these sea grass habitat must be maintaining the environmental conditions of that particular area uh, so uh, that is also known as blue carbon so that's the importance of sea grass so uh, i i need to mention or i need to hi uh, highlight here apart from this uh, importance uh, the sea grass habitats are also important for many turtles and many uh, many other species the dugongs and many other important species uh, comes here for the feeding and uh, other activities again there are shell fishes uh, the gastropods bivalves crabs uh, many other fish prefers this area as a nursery ground uh they get a good environment here as i have mentioned uh, it creates uh, the liters of oxygen the environment is fresh good in condition the sea grass overall also helps in i haven't added the details here but they also helps in maintaining many other you know nutrients or the gases within that environment uh, within the water column as well as within the sediment it also stabilizes the stabilizes the sediment uh, so these are the importance of Uh, you know sea grass habitat we have many uh, sea grass species this uh, photo is from maharashtra we have only two species in maharashtra but apart from the other areas like andaman nicobar lakshadweep uh, gulf of kutch and gulf of manar they hold 11 15 or any uh, more than uh, this the species of sea grass 
which has the long leaves and uh, you know uh, uh, forms the deep meadows of grass uh, in those areas coral reef we have seen many videos in discovery and national geographic channels beautiful color, coral reefs colorful areas many algae many fishes and many organism it holds yes the coral reef is one of the richest uh, ecosystem marine ecosystem i would say uh, uh, but before going into those details i will just tell you uh, the the coral the big thing which you see is actually a colony of these tiny creatures call it call it as a single polyp or a single flower like structures uh, which forms the skeleton of calcium uh, carbonate and forms the reef areas uh, so those are the scleractinian uh, corals but there are soft corals also which do not really hold the calcium carbonate structures sometimes so uh what is there and what is the importance of these uh, single animal or the coral reef is that this reef uh, uh, this polyp or this single animal holds the photosynthetic algae within uh, their tissues within their cells uh, the photosynthesis uh, and shares the carbohydrates or the shares the food with uh, the coral animals and also maintains uh, the oxygen uh, which gets created within the process maintains the environment and that is why whenever there are the intense sunlight or the temperature rises this micro algae within this cell cannot sustain uh, within this high temperature and they lose in uh, the coral structure the coral polyp and the coral become whitish which is uh, not good for the coral reef to uh, survive so that's the main part of the main uh, story of the coral reef apart from that as i've mentioned all these things together maintain a good environmental conditions many fishes uh, many other organism prefer this area and that's why the coral reef becomes one of the richest ecosystem in uh, marine environment or the marine ecosystem so we have almost uh, more than 200 plus species of corals in overall in india we have atoll and the fringing reefs fringing reefs is something which which gets uh, formed along the coastal areas or along the side of the uh, land and the atolls are like uh, the deep pool in between and and the corners of or the periphery of that pool uh, holds the coral reef so the pool would be a very small uh, term to mention these are the large pools uh, probably the kilometer of radius and the the coral reefs are get structure there is a theory there is a theory how these uh, you know atoll reefs and fringing reefs are get formed uh, all across the earth but then that i have haven't mentioned over there uh so that's all about uh, the habitats the intertidal habitats we have so let's let's see what is the biological components uh prefer this habitats so interaction at the coast uh i think for the first slide i have mentioned that these habitats are extremely important in balancing the overall uh marine ecosystem so here is the answer for you this interaction at the coast uh, maintains the marine ecosystem how let me tell you this so there are phytoplanktons the tiny microalgal components which creates uh, which lives within the uh, water column preferably but then photosynthesis and create uh, the food material for the uh, zooplanktons or the larval structures created by all these organisms which lie within the mud flat or within the rocky shores and so on so these larval structures need some place to uh, uh, to survive and to flourish uh, the some uh, the rocky shore organisms which can sustain uh, in that habitat lives the prefers the rocky shore areas the areas which prefers the muddy mangrove areas flourish over there and some of the uh, uh, the uh, Uh, the organism prefers the sandy habitat so here is the answers so together uh, 
these animals uh, create one ecosystem uh, so one animal feeds the another that's the food chain we have and apart from that they also contribute in maintaining the overall physical chemical parameters of that in particular environment and some fishes and many other big animals depends on these small creatures uh, for feeding for uh, and also to these habitats uh for having shelters for spawning and for reproduction purpose and so on and this is how uh, these interactions goes on and this is how it maintains the overall uh, marine ecosystem uh, in that sense so algae and seaweeds uh sequestration carbon habitat where these so coralline algae are also uh, interesting part so uh, we we all know the uh, soft algal material the plant material probably you might have seen somewhere in uh, on the shore uh, but uh, these are the coralline structures which holds the calcium uh, uh, as a skeleton so these structures the algal these are actually algal component which are also interesting in studying because they are the carbonate source and important climate proxies because along with the carbonate they also holds the important data about the climatic condition at that particular uh, uh, time or that particular year or that particular era i would say so the paleo environmental uh, recorder that's why this coralline algae are known as paleo environmental recorder so apart from that there are many other algae which are uh, helping in photosynthetic there are medicinal purpose and many other important components the therapeutic pharmaceuticals and potentials and so on and there are a lot of research uh, going on these algae some of the areas which uh, where some of the species are also uh, you know uh are taken as a meal and there are industrial purposes and so on poriferans are literally sponge which you use uh, literally like a sponge which you use into your daily essentials so uh, these are the pictures of the algae so some of the flat areas uh, which develop along the shore some areas like this uh, which uh, you know forms the heavy spongy structures across standing tall across the uh, substrate so they have a small uh, porous structures so they helps in filtration so uh, it is known as uh, the filtration capacity of sponges uh, is up, up almost the 95% of bacteria and other particles it can be purifies from the water so it takes water inside uh, get the organic content or the bacteria or whatever content it has and again leaves the water so it literally purifies the water uh we can say so this is how these animals are uh, important sea anemones zoanthus and corals these are relatives so uh, anemones sometimes sedentary uh, secondary consumers uh, mostly found in the rocky areas because they needs a substrate the form substrate so zoanthus again a very similar uh, shares a very similar structure like corals but they have like this because we have already seen uh service in slides so nutrient cycling is carbon and many other essential nutrients uh, which gets filtered through or get through the many marine food chains and these are the importance of these images so there are many worms many kinds of worms uh, present within these uh, coastal areas you can see some of the structures here uh, the picture in the left is the dense colony of polychaetes worms which are formed sticking to the wall the rock wall uh, 
this is the close view uh, right on the right side is the close view of that dense colony you can see the architecture of framed by these tiny creatures which are hardly few centimeters long this is the polyclad worm uh, a common species we have in uh, india so wiggling activity of these worm helps in you know sediment movement and in fauna and epifaunal organisms so in fauna organisms which lives within the sediment inside the sediment and the uh, epifaunal organisms uh, which are present or which are preferred to be present uh, above the sediment or upper layers of the sediment so apart from that this uh, there are interesting components which these chemical components which these worms holds having importance in research pharmaceuticals or any uh, therapeutic industries again lot of research is going on it is known that uh, i know about the polyclad worms because these are of my special interest that they holds the toxins within their mucus uh, which are the precursors of toxin which are also found within the puffer fishes and there were some of the experiments which were happening so these puffer fishes receives these toxic components or pre precursors from these polyclads polyclads so this is the interesting interactions between the between these organisms so barnacle brachyurans brachyurans we all know brachyurans are simply crabs uh, we all have seen some or other times uh, at least else barnacles are these structures uh, which are there in the pictures again these animals need some firm substrata to develop uh, the importance of these animals are these are mainly scavengers or feed on the detritus material or the organic content so cleaning simply cleaning is the main uh, function of the brachyurans or the anomurans barnacles are the filter feeders but they also good source of a calcium because you can see here the white structures uh, uh, the white hard shell structures which are form of a calcium carbonate gastropods and bivalves gastropods we all know the shells uh, which we get otherwise and these are the oysters you can see how the shells uh, the bivalves have hide themselves within the two uh, corners of the rocks you can see here as well how they have hide themselves within the crevices formed by the uh, rocks so these are the adaptations these animals shows uh, during the low tide to survive uh, you know uh, or to you know sustain during the intense sunlight so gastropods and bivalves are one of the richest animals or the shells uh, some of are one of the richest animals uh, in the coastal areas uh, many species are eaten up by the humans at uh, different places and then some some species are, again holds the interesting toxin components or the toxin compounds or the precursors which are important uh, or taken up by the other animals and then again the source of a calcium carbonate the kinodum the starfish i think we sometimes we heard about uh, somewhere sometimes we heard about starfishes but the sea cucumbers right here in the middle and the sea urchin are also interesting uh, uh, factors or the interesting animals which you will find commonly uh, dwelling within the rocky or sandy shores so uh, the sea cucumber the very interesting function is ha it has is see uh increasing the or maintaining the water alkalinity the alka once the alkalinity is uh, maintained the formation of carbonate structures or the calcification is uh maintained so that's the function of these animals so see how minute or how fine uh, you know ecosystem services uh these animals are performing and that's why this this the entire uh, you know food way 
or the entire habitat or the ecosystem uh, get sustained so every organism has some or other way something to share within this nature within this environment and hence uh, you know the uh, the habitat uh, the biodiversity the ecology get maintained gets maintained so there are again the predators grazers borers and shredders uh, within the ecosystem they eat up uh, the detritus the organic material so again they also perform the cleaning function like the brachyura said acidians uh, acidians are the flat colonies uh, sometimes uh, uh, you know tube like structures you can see i don't have a picture right now uh, of that so again acidians are very interesting animals because they are not truly vertebrate neither they are invertebrate so they are somewhere in between so evolutionary or the uh, you know research point of view they are very interesting animals to you know uh, learn about uh, they also holds extremely good amount of bioactive compounds the compounds which are again important in many research even the cancer research and many other factors where these compounds are uh, in essential uh, components so apart from these creatures we have whales we have dolphins we have sharks whale sharks uh, turtle species and many many coastal birds or the migratory birds which comes every year to our shoreline uh, whether it's west coast of india east coast of india or island areas uh, for feeding or 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 as the stock over sides we have mangrove species and the coral reef so yeah that's all about habitats and the diversity over there uh, here at the backyard so you can visit any shore uh, whether it's sandy shore rocky shore or the uh, mangrove areas you will see some or other species which i have mentioned uh hearing today's presentation and that's why i have mentioned this that what is in our backyard so all these organism all this diversity is there just lying there adjacent to uh you know habitat which is close to your village a coastal village a creek where there can be a diversity of mangroves diversity of crabs oysters which you otherwise prefer uh during your meal or there are shells interesting shells uh, which you use for the ornamentation uh, then there are coral reefs fishes and many other animals uh, some of the representative animals or the pictures i have shared today in the presentation uh, so that's all about uh, habitats and the diversity tomorrow i will talk about the conservation issues or what are the interferences we have uh and the what is the effect of those interferences uh over these habitats or the diversity over there so i would like to have or the floor is open for discussion anyone have any questions or any thought to share any experiences to share please i would like to hear about thank you ma'am i request participant to share your views or do you have any question regarding uh, ocean and what your presentation ma'am has given so please uh, be free to ask anything any experiences uh, people wants to share like they have visited some of the coral reefs probably they have because there are a lot of recreational uh, opportunities available uh, for us in andaman in maharashtra as well in other parts of india so any anyone have uh, any experiences to share because these are the experiences i would 
you know uh, i can take this for the tomorrow's presentation how these recreational activities are you know if we do not maintain a real balance between these activities and the habitats and many other factors then what can be you know uh, the effects uh, we can face so anything to share i would like to hear about I think you know. Any participants who wants to ask any of the questions? Yeah, uh, I can I basically say something that I should have said in the beginning, uh, because obviously when I started saying it, I realized that my my microphone was uh, switched off. My microphone was on mute. So yes, sir, sure, you can yeah. go ahead. So this is for uh, for Reshma's benefit, uh, but also to thank in a in in a profuse way to thank her. But uh, just to tell Reshma, although she knows a little bit about the background of this program, etc. But I just want to say that the uh, the International Ocean Institute, uh, which is conducting this program worldwide, um, and we are one of the countries they have chosen uh, to work with, uh, was established in 1972, uh, back in uh, almost now how many uh, 50 years ago, uh, in in the uh, in, in the country of Malta, uh, which is which then later on became kind of. Uh, uh, the center for law of the sea developments in many different ways, including uh, a major institute of the International Maritime Organization, which is based there, which is the International Maritime Law Institute. But the International Ocean Institute, going back to 50 years ago, uh, was actually the starting point or the, uh, or the uh, accelerator of many developments uh, in law of the sea. Now, this was established by Elizabeth Mann Borghese, uh, who was my mentor, uh, and I had uh, the great fortune uh, to be associated with her from 1982 uh, to 2002 when she died. Uh, she uh, is one of the greatest influences on, on my life, apart from, of course, my parents. So when the International Ocean Institute, with whom I have a long association going back from 1982 onwards, for now almost 40 years, uh, when they asked me whether... I would be, uh, I, I would like to, uh, uh, you know, conduct such programs on behalf of them. Uh, I was uh, more, both delighted and honored, uh, uh, and I felt privileged that I could do that. Uh, so I spoke to uh, Vinita, uh, who heads the Tear Policy Center, and she readily accepted the offer. Then we had a few uh, kind of negotiations between myself 
the Tair Policy Center uh, and the International Ocean Institute. And there we are because of the drive that Vinita Apte has through her Tair, Pol Tair Policy Center and her colleagues. Uh, within a matter of a few weeks, I should say, uh, we were able to do this from start to finish in the sense that uh, I think the, uh, the, the ideas started going back and forth uh, only about a month ago. And here we are uh, within a matter of uh, you know, less than a month. We have launched a program on 22nd of March, which was the uh, World Water Day. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm actually very grateful to you, Reshma, uh, for uh, giving this a different dimension through your extensive knowledge uh, and experience uh, of, the, uh, of India's coastline and the coastal biodiversity of India. So uh, your lecture was uh, uh, erudite, very uh, full of a uh, lot of information, but you also uh, used, uh, used very simple ways to explain things uh, to lay, lay person. So somebody like me, for example, uh, could understand all of it. And that is uh, a, a great credit to you. Uh, and I'm grateful to you for today. Uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, your, your next lecture tomorrow, uh, which will again be a new dimension to, uh, to what we, we, we've been talking about the last seven sessions. And it is also very complimentary to what it works both ways. So thank you very much for that. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the compliments. That are really very encouraging for me. Uh, but to share a thought uh, about uh, these habitats, why always it was me very fortunate to have uh, working with these habitats because uh, there are birds, there are sharks, bears, and all these big animals, the corals for that matter, known to everyone. Some or other way, somewhere, uh, you know, these animals, uh, the importance, the information about these animals is shared through, uh, you know, many systems, like whether it's a discovery channel or the uh, newspaper article or many other things. But there are many, many other small, uh, you know, creatures uh, lying within these habitats, which are literally, literally not known to anyone apart from the researchers or the people who study this within their you know uh, degree or post degree or doctoral doctorate level so i think that's the important part uh, uh, which i would like to highlight that this is very important to take this information to common people that look it's not always a maldives or australia or the great barrier reef we also have that diversity it's just that uh, you know we need more uh, activities like probably like this or many other factors or many other activities, uh, you know, uh, the educational awareness activities probably, so that this knowledge can be transfer uh, transformed from researchers to common people. And I think that is very important. And that's why I will, uh, I say that, uh, uh, you know, it's very common to take a bicycle over a sandy shore. But what will happen if you are, you know, taking a bicycle or a four wheeler to a sandy shore what is the effect of that four, four wheeler will have over the sandy shore i think that that i will highlight we all know that but it is very important that the common people understand that their day-to-day -day activities the small activities probably how they probably hampering you know uh, these habitats the yeah. creatures living over there and how they probably influencing the entire ecosystem probably minutely but yes, the effects are there. So I think uh, for me also, uh, I'm thankful that, you know, you are also interested in taking this subject uh, and making people understanding that, uh, you know, the policies, the overall international activities about the marine systems, the ecosystems, the conservation ideas, the policy making, uh, and the coastal habitats right there in your, you know, backyards so thank yeah. you very much for this thank you you know thank you opportunity yeah and thank you madam for me to introduce this family you're mute
you are trying to say something no thanks thanks reshma for coming actually and uh, is there anyone who uh, who want to ask some questions or it has already done because in between i call someone called me so i have just uh, was on other call if you have any questions you can email me as well uh, no issue we can answer the questions uh, through the email or we can be in touch through the emails no problem no worries uh, uh, what is the subject of tomorrow reshma uh, it's about the conservation uh, issues related to mm -hmm. these habitats and the diversity which i have covered today so it will okay. be like a link so this is the diversity this is the importance of habitat and what are those interferences which we are creating within this habitat so that will be for tomorrow great sudhir sir do you have any questions or you need to talk something about no i already i already said uh, what i wanted to say Uh, and okay. i have uh, i have thanked reshma and i have introduced the concept of international ocean institute and this program and everything i have told her about it for her benefit and uh, okay uh, and uh, i'm i'm very much looking forward to her next lecture today she really very well encapsulated um, uh, these the you know the, the, the biodiversity uh, in the indian coastal area and tomorrow she is going to talk Correct. about the cons conservation of the same so uh, it's a very uh, impressive Uh, and encapsulated lecture and i was quite thrilled to uh, listen to it so thank you reshma and thank you for uh, thank you uh, vinita for for bringing reshma on board thank you yeah. thank you uh, so we are closing today little early uh, and we will meet tomorrow at the same time at 350 okay Yes. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And all Thank participants you, for the joining. Hope you Thank all you. enjoyed the session. And we'll end the today's session. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.